breast cancer those are two words your patients don't want to hear and news that you don't want to deliver unfortunately for one in eight american women it's a truth they'll have to face in their lifetime and the risks are clear besides being female the two major risk factors for developing breast cancer are advancing age and family history in fact about 80 percent of women diagnosed with invasive breast cancer are age 50 and older and while family history of the disease is an important risk factor up to 80 percent of women diagnosed with breast cancer don't have one unfortunately many women still have misperceptions about who is at risk they think i don't have a family history of breast cancer so i don't need to worry my mom had breast cancer but i'm only 43. the good news is that with early detection we can try to reduce the risk of breast cancer mortality through awareness and education we hope to improve patients willingness to be screened for breast cancer to help in this effort lily has created the strength in knowing breast cancer awareness program and website it's designed to educate women about their individual risks and provide a means for them to share this knowledge with others. At strengthinknowing.com, women can hear from professionals as they discuss the importance of knowing the risks of breast cancer, find out about events they can attend in their city, and help spread the message. The resources may also be helpful to you and your practice. There is strength in knowing about the risks of breast cancer. So spread the word today. Visit strengthinknowing.com and tell your patients to visit too. I didn't realize I was at risk until I visited. I told my sister, my mother, and my aunt. This program is sponsored by Eli Lilly and Company. Answers that matter. You're listening to ReachMD XM 157, the channel for medical professionals. Welcome to Advances in Women's Health, sponsored in part by Eli Lilly. Your host is Dr. Lawrence Stryker, Assistant Clinical Professor of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Northwestern University Medical School, the Feinberg School of Medicine. Uterine artery embolization is one of the few safe, effective, non-surgical options available for treatment of symptomatic uterine fibroids. In spite of the fact that this option is appropriate and efficacious, there remain many short-term and long-term clinical issues that must be addressed as the number of women undergoing this procedure increase. Today, we are joined by Dr. Bruce McLucas, a clinical assistant professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at UCLA, to discuss short and long-term outcomes for the patient undergoing uterine artery embolization for symptomatic fibroids. Welcome, Dr. McLucas. Thanks for having me. I'd like to start with talking about some of the short-term problems, specifically pain management and recovery. As, as you and I are aware, many patients opt for uterine artery embolization because they're trying to avoid the pain and recovery associated with surgery, yet sometimes these patients do have days of severe pelvic pain due to ischemic necrosis and hyaline degeneration. And in fact, I've had patients who've had both a UAE and then a laparoscopic hysterectomy and tell me the hysterectomy was actually less painful. So what do you tell patients to expect, and how do you manage procedure and post-procedure pain issues? Well, pain is one part of the post-embolization syndrome. It's uh, pain, some nausea, and some temperature elevation, and, and it's almost universal. It was described initially by the Japanese when they embolized liver tumors uh, back in the 70s. And it, it is a problem with uterine artery embolization. I tell my patients who've had any kind of laparotomy that this is going to be uncomfortable, but nothing compared to laparotomy-type pain. But I also tell them that it's going to be an issue and we have to be ready for it. We have done a number of patients as an outpatient, doing early in the morning, managing the pain control, and letting them go home in the afternoon. Most of our patients require a 23-hour hold, however. And how are you managing the pain? Well, the, the perfect pain management isn't there. We apply a scopolamine patch and a fentanyl patch, 20 micrograms scopolamine, I mean a fentanyl patch. Before the procedure, we give our patient Toradol transcatheter prior to embolization and it's hard to say because we don't randomize these patients, but our pain is certainly manageable. We haven't had anyone writhing around. And may I say, Dr. Stryker, there's no prediction of size. You'd think, gee whiz, I do a huge fibroid uterus, it's going to be a lot more painful. And, and that just hasn't been our experience. Which is my next question, of course, is can you predict who's going to have more pain? Sometimes it's, 
just eyeballing the patient and saying, is this somebody who's prepared for the surgery? Is she understanding that there's going to be some discomfort? And will she handle that discomfort well? It's, it's part of the art of being a surgeon, I think. Are these patients all routinely offered epidural anesthesia? We don't use epidural don't anesthesia. I think one of the big benefits to uh, uterine artery embolization is that it's done under sedation and the patient doesn't have to undergo the risks of any kind of anesthesia, including epidural. Now, uh, we know that epidural is used uh, routinely in, in deliveries around the country, and it's been with very low problems, but uh, we just haven't had to. We haven't had to have that extra added. Yeah, you know, at my center, of course, all the patients do receive epidural anesthesia, and I'm wondering if there are any studies comparing pain using your method of analgesia versus epidural? I'm not aware of any. Frankly, uh, it's a little bit like some of the early writers who wrote about uterine artery embolization suggested the use of an epidural, and then it was commonly performed by a couple other centers. But I would say the vast majority, and, and that's you know, 85%, 90% of the cases being performed in the United States are not being done with epidural. Dr. McLucas, I think you're familiar with an article that was published in Obstetrics and Gynecology this month, January, looking at the long-term outcomes of women who have undergone uterine artery embolization, and the, the results were pretty impressive. Can you review the study and the results? The initial work that was done by Jacques Ravina in the Lancet article in 1995, when he looked at, I think, about 20 patients in that article, it's still the same good results. There are mm-hmm. similar results that we have that, that this study has had that a number of patients who are now in, in our center at UCLA are 15 years out. There's no revascularization of my the chances of secondary hysterectomy are low in these patients. The morbidity is extremely low compared to the morbidity of myomectomy. You know, Dr. Stryker, it's, it's hard for me to tell another clinician the best way of, of dealing with a compromise or a comparison between embolization, but to me, it's always seemed that it should be myomectomy versus embolization because if a patient really wants to have this problem solved by taking her uterus out, then there's really no advantage to leaving the uterus in. Most of my patients have decided they really don't want to throw out the baby in the bathwater. They want to keep their uterus. Now, and your point is well taken because, of course, all of the studies looking at uterine artery embolization are comparing the outcomes to hysterectomy as opposed to myomectomy, as does this study in obstetrics and gynecology. The other issue, of course, is they talk about long-term outcomes being three years. I don't think of three years as being long-term outcomes. And yet you say you have people in your experience who are 15 years out. Are you aware of any data that's been published looking at at more than three years, more than three to five years? I think when we were first doing this procedure, Dr. Goodwin and myself in 1994, everyone was saying, well, we don't have long-term data. We don't have long-term data. There are studies that have been published out seven years. It's not as many patients, of course, but I'm having been in this embolization game for so long, I can tell you that there's no late sequelae that are going to come up here. And if we're talking about myomectomy, we have to be aware of the recurrence rate. Our first 100 patients at UCLA were all patients who had failed myomectomy. You're listening to Advances in Women's Health on ReachMD XM157, the channel for medical professionals. I'm Dr. Lauren Stryker, and today I'm speaking with Dr. Bruce McLucas, a clinical assistant professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at UCLA. We are discussing short and long-term clinical issues surrounding fibroid embolization. Now, in addition to the article that just came out this month, the EMI trial, the embolization with hysterectomy trial, was published not very long ago and, again, was comparing embolization to hysterectomy. And in that trial, they showed that the t- at two years, 23% of the patients had a hysterectomy after having gone uterine artery embolization. But in this recent article in Obstetrics and Gynecology, only 9% of patients ended up with a hysterectomy. I'm curious, are you aware in this current article who it was that needed a hysterectomy and could that have been predicted? And then, of course, why there was such a huge difference between the two studies. Some of this gets back to a pre-op evaluation. If you've got a procedure for the wrong indication, it's not going to work. So I'm not aware of the number of patients in this first study that you're describing, the EMI study, who ended up on pathology having adenomyosis. But I know that's been in our center, the pathologic diagnosis on many 
uteruses that have been removed by a hysterectomy. But secondly, I'd like to say that we've done a number of repeat procedures on patients. I mentioned uh, to you before that we do a MRI at two months following embolization. And anybody who has blood flow continuing to the myomata, we will offer them a repeat procedure. And, and doing that, our success rate's gone from 90% up to about 96%. Uh, very few procedures fail when we find that there may be an extra gonadal uh, supply of blood to the myomata or that the arteries were in spasm and we didn't completely embolize them the first time around. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you take the position that uterine artery embolization is an appropriate option to offer women who desire future fertility. And in fact, in 2001, you published a paper looking at the impact on fertility in pregnancy and concluded that the risks were similar to myomectomy and that the desire for future fertility should not be a contraindication to UAE. But in the literature, and even ACOG says that the safety of pregnancy after uterine artery embolization has not been established, and therefore the procedure should be reserved for women who are not contemplating future childbearing. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. I'm a member of ACOG, and I have to tell you, if you look at the treatment of uh, myomata, the pamphlets that are issued about every four years, uh, four years prior, they said uterine artery embolization was not a valid treatment for myomata, so it's an evolving mm-hmm. science. My article that was published, our, I should say our article that was published in 1991, has been followed by two others, a Canadian and a British article, uh, in which their uh, number of patients conceiving is way up and their fertility rate is higher than ours. So we quoted about a 33% fertility rate. They're actually closer to 50%, which is Vessi Buttram's study in the mid-80s, which is the classic one after myomectomy. He said the best you could get. What about complications during those pregnancies, preterm labor, intrauterine growth, retardation, et cetera? Some uh, articles have been written about uh, myomyomata with and without embolization, and, and we know that there's a higher incidence with even small myomata of malpresentation, a higher incidence of breach presentations. There's a, a number of uh, patients who've had premature labor. So we're not getting rid of myomata when we do an embolization. We're shrinking the myomata 50%. So you're going to have a more complicated pregnancy than you would for a woman who has no myomata. I wish to thank our guest, Dr. Bruce McLucas, for sharing his viewpoints on many of the controversies surrounding uterine artery embolization for treatment of fibroids. Thank you for listening to Advances in Women's Health, sponsored in part by Eli Lilly, with your host, Dr. Lawrence Stryker. For more details on the interviews and conversations in this week's show, or to download the segment, please go to reachmd.com forward slash women's health.